Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Digging Deep Bible Study. I'm David Reynolds. It's such a pleasure and an honor to be with you this morning. And if you're joining online, welcome there as well. You have Miss Kate and Jeffrey with you and, and hope you enjoy your time with them. They're wonderful people and I'm so grateful for them to be a part of our online team. So thank you so much, guys. Um, please open your Bibles to Psalm 139. And for those of you that are in here, I've already uh, placed a, a Crystal Ferretti was so nice to print out a nice um, print out of the psalm this morning and um, the consecutive pages behind it was where it breaks down and we have space for you to write any notes that you'd like to take today. So please take advantage of that. I'm so thankful that y'all are here. So a few weeks ago, I decided I was going to sit down and actually watch something on TV. So as I'm scrolling through to look at what to watch um, I found a documentary, and of all things that I would watch, it was a documentary on guinea pigs. Yeah. <laughs> guinea pigs, of all things. I was like, okay, I'll watch this. I was looking for something to just kind of um, chillax on. And so my son, Brooks, he's seven years old. He's got his Nintendo in his hand, his Nintendo Switch, and he comes and he's wedged with me sitting in our sofa chair in the living room. And I'm watching this documentary on guinea pigs. And so all of a sudden, of all things, so guinea pigs are from the land of Peru natively. And so the Incas, the Incan Empire, uh, would actually worship them in ceremonies as if they were gods. And in this documentary, no kidding, who knew? In this documentary, they're doing this reenactment of this ritual. And at this time, I start to realize that my son is no longer looking at his Nintendo, but he is looking at the TV, and I'm looking at his face, and he is perplexed. And he's like, Daddy, that is silly. That's not God. What are they doing? And so I took a moment there with my son, and I was thinking, you know what? I'm going to ask him some questions here. So I asked Brooks. I said, Brooks, how do you know our God is the real God? And he said, well, Daddy, he goes, God made me, word for word. I said, okay, Brooks. I said, well, how do you know God made you? See, I thought I was going to talk with him to teach him something. And he said, because he loves me, Daddy. <laughs> and I just immediately just went into just thinking with the Lord of, you know, we pursue you all the time. I seek your knowledge of you. I seek, I seek to learn. I seek to, to serve you. I seek to do all of these things with you. And somehow in the middle of that, I forget and I forget to, to look and to ponder upon and to just think about how much you love me. I get so focused on how much I love you, but what about how much you love me? And so today... Today's message, the title of my teaching today is how much to know, to know how much God loves us. And we're going to look to Psalm 139 to do that. But let's first go to prayer. If everybody would bow your hands and say after me, dear most heavenly father, your kingdom come, your will be done. Heavenly father. Make us more like you through your word today. Teach us your ways, <clears throat> O Lord, that we may live by your truth. Give us undivided hearts that we may fear your name. In Jesus' name, amen. And so I'm just going to read Psalm 139 for you right now. And then we're going to go into our study. And so... To the choir master, a psalm of David. So this is a psalm of David. It's a psalm. And we start in verse 1. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. 
you hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your hand, your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as day, for darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In the book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! Some of them, if I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake, and I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God! O men of blood, depart from me! They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me, lead me in the way everlasting. So the first six verses here, the first six verses they deal with God's omniscience. The word omniscience is just a fancy way of saying that he knows everything. He's all-knowing. And so when we look at this, you have searched and known me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You search out my path. You search out where I am going and where you are leading me. And my rest. He is acquainted with you and I in all your ways. Before there's a word on our tongue, he knows it altogether. What David is doing is he's bringing this understanding about God, not that he's just this all-knowing being that can just make things and we're just a checklist or just one grain of sand in his creation. No, this is not, Lord, you know all things and searched all things. This is, Lord, you know me. You take your omniscience and you pour that intentionally into me and you focus it upon me. That's what we're talking about today. We want to connect with the Lord and how much he loves us. He knows you and he searches you. When we go to... to to verse 5, you hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. He encloses us and he guards us. This hemming in, he's slowing us down. He lays his hand upon us. He will discipline us. He loves us so much that he will put us in every situation to get our attention. To say, look to me, my child. I love you so much. And I want you to know how much I love you and I want to guide you there. So why do we hem the ends of a garment? Why do we hem the ends of a garment? It's to make it last longer, to endure. What happens if we don't hem? It frays, it tatters, it breaks down from the ends, from the outside, right? So he hymns us in with his truth, his love, his true love, his enduring love. 
and he hems us in so that we can endure with him. That's the beauty of this. Even though he lays his hand upon us, even though he may discipline us, even though we may be tried, and we're going to get to that. That's what this is about. David goes on to say, such knowledge is too wonderful to me. This knowledge is understanding that God does this for him. We need to understand that for us. It's so high, he cannot attain it. Can we attain it? No. We're not meant to have all understanding. But to know that everything God does for us, every single detail of everything that he does is out of his love for us. As we move to verses 7 through 12, this section is about God's omnipresence. And that's just a fancy word for he is everywhere. He's everywhere. We can't escape him. He also never abandons us. Where shall I go from your spirit? Nowhere. There's nowhere we can go from his spirit. Where shall I flee from your presence? There's nowhere. I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. Now look at this parallel going into verse 9 from verse 8 that I just read. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. This is about, it's not a matter of time with God. It's not a matter of place. It's not a matter of circumstance. The wings of the morning here. This is the sun rising in the east, the new day, the new creation of a day, the sun rising in the east. And then we look in the sea. Think about where David's at. Think about where Israel is. The Mediterranean Sea is to his west, and the sun is moving towards the west. So this, this idea of time, this idea from morning until night, he is with us. He is everywhere. So Matt Monk, he preached or came up here and taught some, some weeks back. Maybe some of you remember when Matt Monk talk, taught on archetypes. And an archetype is just something in the Bible that represents a certain topic or a certain, a certain point of view or a certain happening throughout Scripture. And so he taught on the archetype of the sea and how the archetype of the sea represented chaos. You know, we think of the great flood. We think of, um, we think of Jonah, right? Jonah in the boat and, and, and the storm comes upon him. And then twice in the gospel, we see where, where Jesus and the disciples are moving towards the Decapolis. They're actually moving east and they, they, they hit the rushing storms in both times. Jesus um, laid a nice gospel message for us in those and we're not going to get into those today. But you see this idea of the sea. And so here, even here, you search out my, um, the uttermost parts of the sea. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, whether it's heaven or in Sheol, the uttermost parts of the sea is that great circumstance, that chaos that we're in. Even there, he is with us. Even there, he is with us. We cannot escape him, and he will never, ever abandon us. Your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. With verse 5, he says, I lay my hand upon you. He lays his hand upon us. So his hand lays up his hand, he lays his hand upon us for discipline, to hold us, to hem us in. He also lays his hand upon us to lead us. He also uses his right hand to hold us. That's his love for us. He places his hand upon us. He leads us. He holds us. We're going to get to verses 11 and 12 here in a little bit. We're going to come back. Omnipotence. Omnipotence is a fancy word for he has infinite power. And that's what we get into in verses 13 through 16. He has infinite power. And this is where I get choked up. Years ago, January 12th, 2011, I wasn't seeking God. 
I walked into Northeast Baptist, um, uh, Northeast Houston Baptist Church, and it was a Wednesday night, and that preacher was talking about God's love, and I'm sitting there and I'm listening to this message, and I felt so engulfed, so engulfed and touched by the Lord's love. The Holy Spirit consumed me so much and surrounded me so much that I felt his love so much that I literally had to remove myself from the church because I was in such tears. And it was like my mind was just cleared and he brought me back to him through his love, not just through this message of me needing to love him, but coming into contact with this very context we're talking about today. And this is what endures us. Ever since that day, I've sought his purpose. I've sought his love. I've sought to hold on to that. And just as I mentioned before, when my son, when my son said that to me, sometimes I forget about that. And that message is for everyone in this room and online. To be able to come into contact with how much that he loves us. And as we come into verses 13 through 16, he has infinite power. He could poof us into existence. He could have done whatever he wanted to do and just, we were not a checkbox. You were not a checkbox on God's list of things to do and just thrown into this world to just go about it and live it. No. He formed your inward parts. He knitted us together, knitted us together in our mother's womb. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. His works are wonderful, and each one of us are part of those wonderful works. My frame has not, was not hidden from you. I was intricately woven in the depths of the earth. I am so excited that Ms. Gail Chuba came in this morning, and she brought... You're probably wondering why this bear is with me this morning. And she brings this bear in, and I'm like, that is a beautiful bear. And she's like, I made that bear. I'm like, you made this bear for her grandchildren and her to come. And so I got to talking with her about this bear. And I asked her, I said, how long did it take you to make that bear, Gail? She said, about 100 hours. 100 hours. If I'm right, Gil, and correct me if I'm wrong on anything, there's, there's special fabrics. There's a lot of this had to be done by hand. It couldn't just be done on a machine. And she had to have the pattern laid out. She had to think about exactly how she was going to make this bear. And guess what? It was made out of love as a gift. As a gift. We're all gifts that God made. The time and the detail it took to make something so beautiful, so beautiful and so special and so intimate, God could have poofed us into existence, but I'm here to tell you today, by the words in Psalm 139, he thought about you, he planned you out. He formed the days that were going to be before you before he even threw the stars in the night sky. You, me, you're not just some substance walking around this earth. You were pieced, intricately woven, hemmed by our Lord and Savior, the creator of the universe. How beautiful is that? Before he created us, he wrote everything he desired and formed for us, even our purpose, our purpose. Each one of us has a purpose that he's created us for. We live in this tango between what we have allowed the world to dictate and form who we are and seeking revelation to conforming to and becoming who God created us to be and do what God created us to do. Carmen and I talk about this all the time. How 
Have we been deceived by the world around us? And how has that affected us? How has that grown us? And how has that made us? How have we allowed that to make us who we are today? And what does that look like compared to what God had formed us for out of his love? Gail, you put a message on the bottom of this bear out of love. You put your stamp on it. I know it's pretty funny. Here I am just, hey, look at that. The Lord has stamped each and every one of us with his love. He built every single one of us for a purpose for him. And I think about as a man, especially when I was growing and trying to figure out what a man was. My father in heaven knows exactly the man that I need to be. So where am I going to seek that? I'm going to seek that with him. He loved me enough to not just put me together. He loved me so much that he had a plan for me and he had a purpose for me and he wanted me to seek that and not worry about it. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. We don't have to fret and fray and look everywhere. We just have to go to him. But the trick is, is can we conform to it? Can we see it? Are we looking for it? It's found in his love. It's found in his love. We live in a world that struggles with identity today. I'm not talking about, you know, it's a political thing and we talk about these extremes. I'm not talking about extremes. I see this in myself, the church, and everyday people. We have a father that loves us so much. He already formed everything for us. We just have to ask for it. That's it. Sometimes we get lost in this world and we feel like we're abandoned. What we're seeing right now, we're never abandoned. We're never forsaken. He is always with us. Always with us. We come to verses 17 and 18. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sun of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. The Lord's thoughts of us are greater than the sand which covers the earth. And you know what's cool? I was thinking about this. I'm a geologist um, by schooling. (laughs) Sand is continually being remade through processes of erosion. So too, his thoughts are still being created for us each and every day. His thoughts, I I can't even imagine. That is how crazy God is about you and me. He is crazy about you. Maybe it's Valentine's Day coming up Tuesday and I'm getting all caught up in love and, and thinking about that. I don't know. I just want it to be about him and how much he loves me. Raise your hand if you want to know all God's thoughts of you. Raise your hand. If you want to know that, seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Ask and you will receive, Jesus says. When we wake in the morning, (laughs) when you wake in the morning with your morning breath, (laughs) your calyxed hair, your, uh, your grouchiness that is yet to be Redeemed by coffee. (laughs) Our Father is there for us to greet Him. He is right there with you. I just look at this. I awaken. I am still with you. He is with us. And you can talk to Him right then and there. He is there with you where you are, loving you and ready to just pour into you and me. He creates the day, the wings of the day. The wings of the morning, I should say, for us to walk in it with him, for him to give us all that he has for us. For he says in Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. So now we move from kind of this, you know, his omniscience, his omnipresence, We move into this whole other section of slaying the wicked and departing from me, O men of blood. I want to talk about this for just a second. 
We live in a different covenant in a different time. Okay, that's first and foremost. David, his call, the covenant of Abraham and through Moses, it was always about the land and the people. His people, that land, it was all meant for a purpose and it was a covenant made with them to do that. David's calling was to unify the kingdom of people, to unify. So his enemies were actually fleshly enemies. Yes, spiritual, but fleshly enemies in the covenant that they were living in. So he had these actual enemies that were fighting against and trying to destroy the unification of the people of Israel. We are called through Jesus Christ to love our who? To love our enemies. We are called to love our enemies. And I just wanted to bring that here because vengeance belongs to the Lord and that still was there then. But he loves us so much that he came down off his throne and he came to the cross willingly so that in him and abiding in him, that full, truthful love of sacrifice for us, that we could love our enemies, that we could give forgiveness as he gave forgiveness, that we could be the light of the world by being in him as he is the light of the world. The Lord is a righteous judge and vengeance belongs to him and to him alone. He loves us that much that he already won our battles with the enemy. So let's look at spiritual enemies. Go back to verses 11 and 12. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. I think of as I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and I believe Pastor Randy some months back did a sermon um, on this, but there is no match for the light of God. There is no match, and I just touched on this, but through the ultimate love of the cross and our faith placed in the cross, when we proclaim him Lord of our life, we are in Christ the light of the world, and by this we too are the light of the world. Though we may walk through the shadows of death, darkness cannot and will not overcome us. We are already the victor in Christ. That is how abundant his love is for us. We come to 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. So I want to tell you, I know it's hard to believe. It's going to be hard to believe, but I mess up sometimes. Maybe once, I don't know, every six months, year, five. But after I mess up and I ask for forgiveness, I don't know. Sometimes I ask Carmen, I'm like, sweetheart, from afar, <laughs> do you like me? Do you still, do you, do you like me? And she'll just, I love you, David. <laughs> and I'm like, but no, but do you like me? And she goes, I love you. And it's really funny, but when I was thinking about this, I think how much we just want to be liked and admired. And what true love truly is. The Lord, just like my wife, he's not going to condone my wrongdoing. He's not going to get behind my fleshly wants and my fleshly desires and the things that I want and just bless those, right? He's not going to just do that. He's going to hem us in and he's going to lay his hand upon us and he's going to show us whether we are looking for it or not, 
He's going to try to get our attention and show us what he's created for us and what he's made for us. And right here, right here, search me, O God, and know my heart. This is David being humbled before the Lord and his love for him. Are we humble before the Lord and his love for us? He says, try me and know my thoughts. We're now almost reciting the very beginning of this psalm. God already does that. God already tries us. David is being willing to say, I'm listening, God. Thank you for loving me so much that you are the most perfect father. See if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting through his sanctification, in his love, abiding in him, listening to him, thinking about his thoughts, wanting to know his thoughts, understanding that he created us over a period of time, over thousands of years as thoughts of our Father in heaven. We were and still are and his purpose for us. We were not just flung into existence. We are something special to him, unique to him. He created us as a gift into the world as a vessel to pour his light into through his word and his love so that we too can pour that out to the world. So the applications today, know how, mu how much and how intimately God loves you. Know that. Seek, ask, and know God's thoughts of you in relation to him revealing your grievous ways. Be willing to receive his love as a disciplinarian, as showing you what to repent from and where to be led to. Seek, ask, and know God's thoughts of you in regards to his purpose for you. He formed that purpose again. He formed that purpose for you before, and me, before he ever threw the stars into the night sky. Do we want and desire to know that? I want you to think about those things this week. I want you to think about those things. I want you to connect with the amount of love that he has for you. Read this throughout the week. Read it in the morning when you wake up, as I was saying, when you have that cowlick in your hair and, and you haven't yet got the grouchiness out of you with that coffee. Take some time with the Lord and just read Psalm 139 and ponder on his love for you and think about those things. I want everybody to close your eyes. I want you to bow your head. I do. I just want you to take a moment. And I want you to bow your head. And I want you to listen to the words the Lord has for you today. I want you to listen to it. My child, I have searched you and known you. I know when you sit down and when you rise up, I discern your thoughts from afar. I search out your path and your lying down, and I am acquainted with all your ways. Even before a word is on your tongue, behold, I know it altogether. Yes, I hem you in behind and before and lay my hand upon you, but it is out of my love for you. Seek my knowledge of you, for it is wonderful. It is so high you may not always have understanding, but trust in me. You cannot escape my presence or my spirit, for I never have, I never will abandon you. I am with you in the highest of highs and the lowest of lows, no matter where you are, my precious child, my hand is there to lead you. Reach out. Reach out, my child, and take it. My hands are there to hold you. Embrace me. Darkness may come to shatter you, my child, but abide in me, remain in me, run to me. For my light, my love, cannot be overcome. I will always be your refuge, your strength. Put on my full armor so that the wicked enemy shall fall from you and depart from you. I formed your inward parts. 
I knitted you together in your mother's womb. I created you to give all of myself to you, all of myself to you, and for you to give all yourself to me. I made you wonderfully. Your frame was and never will be hidden from me. I intricately, intricately created you. Even before I created you, I wrote everything I desired and formed for you. My thoughts of you are so vast, they are more than the sand. Are my thoughts precious to you? Do you desire to know my thoughts and everything I desire and have formed for you? Ask and seek them, and I will reveal them to you. I will zealously search you and always know your heart. I will try you and know your every thought. I will reveal to you any grievous way within you and lead you in the way everlasting. Why, my child? Because I love you, my child, completely and insurmountably. All throughout my history, your faithfulness has walked beside me. The winter storms made way for spring. In every season, from where I'm standing, and I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. And I see your promises and fulfillment all over my life. All over my life. Help me remember when I'm weak. The fear may come, fear will leave. You lead my heart to victory. You are my strength and you always will be. I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. And I see your promises and fulfillment all over my life, all over my life. Praise you, Lord, Father, now and forever. Thank you for loving us so much. Amen.